we are indeed recording. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our second community call of this year, unless I'm very much mistake mistaken. Um, we missed our community call at the end of what would it have been February. Um, we've been very much heads down, crunching through a whole load of work, which we look forward to updating you on um, in the course of today's call. Um, but thanks to everybody for joining today. Um, we've got a number of things to announce and discuss, so look forward to doing that and also getting feedback from folks as well um, on those proposals, release updates um, in due course as well. Um, so without further ado, I think we can just move on. Um, yep, to just talk about the um, agenda for today being there's release updates, um, project updates, um, Talking about KubeCon EU, uh, and our, we have a number of folks from the team planning to be there at KubeCon EU. So if you are also going to be at KubeCon EU, it'd be great to liaise, uh, meet up, talk about all things Q, whether that be modules proposal or enhancements or changes you'd like in Q, whatever it might be, um, let us know. Um, we are actually going to be not doing a community highlight reel today. Um, the last few community calls have been just a tiny bit too long where we've been getting close to like an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes, and that's stretching things a bit. So we're gonna keep things tight today and instead actually double down on um, sharing more of what's happening in the Q community via Twitter um, and other mediums as well. So we really are targeting 50 minutes today. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Marcel to talk about um, release updates. Uh, you're just on mute, Marcel, one second. Mute, yeah, sorry about that. So basically, as you might have noticed, uh, 0 0.5 is uh, finally out. It took a very long time. Um, there's reasons for that. Um, so basically, we are doing a rework of the evaluator, essentially. And um, it's hard to do everything at once, but in order to, to get it fully polished, it sort of needs to be done all at once. So. There are still some little little glitches in 0 0.5, if you will, and, and not all bugs are fixed, obviously. Uh, but we wanted to move forward with, uh, with the newer releases. So uh, also what's out uh, today, I believe, or, or yesterday, is uh, 0 0.6 alpha 1. Um, so this adds required fields. So in order to implement required fields, we had to uh, restructure optional fields which was in turn necessary to, um, uh, to tackle some of the performance problems, believe it or not. Um, so basically, we, um, um, we decided to release this first. It's also very useful. There's a whole bunch of users that, that want to um, use required fields uh, in, in for policy applications or other applications. So we found um, you know, there's quite a few use cases for required fields. So figured might as well release that first um, now. Also, some of the new documentation that's, that's, uh, that we have written sort of assumes required fields and things can be written quite a bit nicer. Um, so this is the second required field proposal based on it, not the first one, which was quite a bit different. Um, so then in alpha two, we will also, coming out fairly soon, we also want to uh, release the first implementation of Wasm. So Aram will talk about that um, uh, later. Um, and then in alpha three, we might also have the first implementation of uh, modules. So 0 0.6 is already, uh, as it's already in alpha, so coming out for following right after 0 0.5 release. Um, but also 0 0.7 is for a, you know, not as much, but I would say 50% implemented, something like that. And that will focus very much on performance uh, improvements. Um, it's, it's quite um, a, a simplification of the evaluator, really. So part of where a lot of the bugs came from, what made maintenance hard is that there were many paths to do the same thing. So 0 0.7 really cleans this up and have like one path for each kind of, um, um, use case in the evaluator, um, which really uh, both makes things faster and cleaner and easier to maintain. Um, so the disjunction algorithm has become a lot simpler as a result of that. And we can, uh, there's a whole slew of performance perf um, improvements that we can do there. 
There's a new closeness algorithm, which combines the best of 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, which allows us to fail really early and thereby also elimin eliminating disjunctions early, which is um, actually right now, from what we've observed, one of the biggest performance issues. So this is um, more than one um, uh, performance improvement uh, for disjunctions that we can fix there. Um, so we, we think that this will, um, I mean, there's many different performance problems that will uh, that are affecting users, but we uh, think 0 0.7 will tackle uh, many of those um, with a, a lot more of them, uh, making a lot more possible improvements a lot easier down the line. Um, so 0 0.8 has already also been implemented partly, um, but these will require some backwards uh, incompatible language changes. I mean, minor, but still towards a zero uh, v, v1, like open lists. Uh, this is to make things more uh, consistent and more usable based on a lot of user feedback. So that will, um, um, but we'll do that after the performance uh, focus. So right now, all the development since required fields is essentially out. So uh, a lot of the development on, on my part, at least, is uh, on performance and correctness, focus on performance and correctness. I think it's probably just worth, uh, worth mentioning, Marcel, um, for everybody's benefit. 0 0.5 has been a release that's been a long time in the making, um, as those regulars on the communi community call will attest. Um, thank you to everybody who's been diligent in trying out the pre-releases, helping to report bugs, etc. It has been a very long road. Um, and it's just worth acknowledging that at this point in time is that you might be left wondering, it's almost been a year since 0 0.4.3, you might be left sort of wondering what on earth is happening. Um, can we expect releases on a more regular cycle? And as Marcel's just updated, that is very much the intention. So now that we have, we've sort of, we had to draw a line at some point under 0 0.5 because we were actually spending more time on fixing things in 0 0.5 than we would have done implementing changes in 0 0.7 and then fixing it in 0 0.7. So there was a sort of a cost benefit point that where we, we tipped a bit of a threshold there. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, Daniel will speak about that later, but basically, um, so anybody that registered in Unity would uh, was fairly easy to very early detect problems with potent, you know changes that we were making. So all of the problems with 0 0.5 were really from people that did not register in Unity where we just ran into these issues later, right? So if you really want to avoid uh, in the future uh, new releases breaking, you just register in Unity. So we know that um, this was hard for some people because we didn't support um, uh, private repos, but uh, Daniel will, will talk about uh, support for that um, yep. also in this uh, community call. The only other thing to say is that we'll also be starting a discussion that talks in a bit more detail um, about what Marcel has talked about here, the, uh, effectively a discussion about release plans, um, what's happened um, with some frequently asked questions. Please feel free to respond to that discussion if you feel like your question or concern hasn't been addressed in some way, shape or form. We really want a sort of centralized um, discussion about releases um, in that discussion. Uh, so we'll be publishing that shortly after the call today. Um, Marcel, anything else, or did you want to move on? Yeah, I'll move on to modules. So this is oh. uh, um, something, well, uh, um, Daniel, I and Roger have been working on, but mostly Roger, really. Um, and um, we just released a proposal also. This is, I think, the third or fourth iteration of the proposal. Um, and, and there's been going a lot of design in this, a lot of um, talks also with uh, implementers of registries and, and proxies. Um, you know, I, I used to be on the Go team, so you can imagine uh, the types of people I've, I've talked to. And, and basically the consensus is um, proxy um, just gives a lot of problems um, for us as well, especially if we look at some of the users we have um, like going with a registry approach just, just saves a lot of trouble and, and even support use cases that otherwise we wouldn't even be able to support. Also the type of use case, uh, we, we have some, some users that are saying we would just never trust the proxy basically. Um, anyway, but there, there's many, many advantages of using a registry, um, which is all discussed in the, in the proposal. So, 
Um, initially, what we plan to do is to only have a, a GitHub app that allows you to to automatically uh, publish new uh, you know new versions of a module once you tag them. Um, but this is definitely so. The, the way it's designed is that it's definitely not the main way or the only way of being able to publish um, new modules. Um, so some users want to be able to fully create um, their own modules without any VCS. Um, so in other kind of you know control flows or workflows, um, so that will be supported then in a in a future release with uh, the go mod publish command. Um, mod publish. What? Pardon? Uh, Q mod Q publish. Mod publish. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah. So please re read the proposal, and and we're we're happy to answer um, any questions. So in the future, we might have a. Um, uh, if if there's you know demand for it, we might have a you know specific um, um, you know hour that you can contact us or whatever to ask questions about modules. Yeah, office hours type setup. Office yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we can save questions at the end if anybody has any sort of specific thoughts about the releases and or modules proposal. Let's cover those at the end if that's okay. We'll just sort of get through the updates in order that we save as much time as possible at the end for questions. Cool. Okay. Uh, I think we're Aram and WebAssembly. Uh, yeah, WebAssembly. So, in case people are not necessarily familiar with WebAssembly, it's a it's a it's a portable format that you can take in in many languages like Rust, even Go to some extent, although not perfect, and and compile it to a portable format. Uh, you can think of maybe as a shell library, if you will, that you can load maybe as a plugin in some other program. Uh, and 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 we want to use. Uh, and so this is extremely useful because it, it allows us to interact with other languages, uh, or more importantly for you, it allows you to interact with code that you might have already written, for example, as, as, as part of, of whatever else you're doing uh, that, is, that, uh, that is currently not available to Q. Uh, but we want to make it available to Q. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so where are we? Well, we, 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 have a, we have an initial implementation that allows essentially to call into uh, WebAssembly modules that use the C API, uh, which, is, which is a very low level API. Um, I mean, the name kind of suggests that it's, it's quite low level. And, and we are in the process of merging this in, in uh, 0 0.6 Alpha 2. Um, we wish to, to expand uh, uh, its functionality because it's be, being just the CABI is quite limited and it's also quite very difficult to use for, for the user. Uh, but more importantly, it's quite limited. So, so in 0 0.6, we're going to add uh, richer data types. Basically, we're going to have more APIs to it that will allow you to uh, pass more complex data back and forth between WASM and, and uh, Q. Uh, also, currently, uh, the code. Uh, uh, the WASM only runs in a sandbox. I mean, it will always, it will always run in a sandbox, but uh, uh, currently it doesn't have access to anything, specifically it does not have access to the Q standard library itself, uh, which is very inconvenient then to write code in that sort of environment. So we wish to enable, uh, 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 the, the, we wish to ex export the, the Q standard library to the, to the uh, WASM code itself so it could, it could use it directly. Um, for, furthermore, uh, uh, we will we will add uh, language specific tooling, for example, for for Rust or for Go, uh, that will kind of uh, hide and abstract away all the details about APIs and what I just talked about, because we want to make this uh, easy and simple for the user. That they should have a, a, a simple solution that just uh, works naturally using the workflow and the tooling. They are kind of accustomed to it and don't have to think about the low level details how to plug it into into Q. so we will we will have uh, something like that uh but but it's uh, further along the way uh, yeah that's it for me i'll pass it on to uh, uh daniel i think daniel yep cool so unity as a quick reminder what unity is is it allows projects to share their config or code with us depending on how they use Q, and that allows us to expand our corpus for performance and regression tests and as Marcel mentioned, that's very important for releases. But it's also good for the project, right? Because um, there's a certain level of certainty that we're not going to break you. Or if we do, there's at least a, a level of coordination and knowledge. So the progress since the last update is basically that the CI integration with our Garrett CLs, our, our code review system, is improved. So for example, right now, when Unity tests a Q change, that's compared against the previous change, uh, the, the parent commit, and that's useful for for example, a long chain of changes to Q. So they're not all compared against the latest release, they're compared against each other, so it's more incremental. And also better diffs. We had a diff algorithm that was quadratic, so that was quite painful. 
Um, we also finished implementing the first version of the GitHub app. Uh, it's a bit similar to what Marcel mentioned with modules, but the use case is different. Uh, and now we're working towards listing it on the GitHub app marketplace. There's a bit of uh, polishing that needs to be done for that. And 0 0.6 and 0 0.7 will rely quite heavily on this um, public app to spot regressions. So uh, like Marcel said, if you want to help us improve the quality of queue, but also want to be notified or prevent breakages altogether with these somewhat major changes that are coming along, then adding your project to Unity is the, the best way to do so. So because the app is not public just yet, uh, it's just days away from that, we've created a form that you can fill in to be notified when it is. And because I realize that some of you might not be aware, uh, oh, we're going to share the slides afterwards. Um, so you, you can link to, you can click on that link afterwards. And we'll also um, tweet as well, Daniel, I think, just so for convenience. So save people having to click through to the, the specific slide. We can send a specific tweet about Unity with a link to the form as well. And just to be completely clear, this app will support both private and public code uh, projects. By that, I mean. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think it's actually me next. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so I'll provide a combined update on qlang.org and LSP. Um, starting in sort of effectively reverse order, LSP work is on hold at the moment whilst we focus on qlang.org. Um, Alpha.qlang.org being the focus, as Marcel suggested, because we need to uh, not just generally improve the Q documentation story, but do so in tandem effectively with the releases uh, of required fields and any future language changes that happen as well. Uh, so for the last month and a bit, um, I was off on uh, paternity leave at the beginning of the year. We've been flushing out design and content issues. Head of a release um, of alpha.qlang.org at KubeCon EU next week. That is an alpha, so it's going to be rough around the edges. The content will be rough around the edges in places as well. The language guide is going to, the, the parts of the language guide we actually publish will be the most polished of that. Um, but what we're looking to try and do in this situation here is, as I said, as a goal of qlang.org and the, the, the working on qlang.org is that we have not only better documentation, as I mentioned, the language guide, but just a more streamlined contribution process as well. So whether that actually be, um, if you like, first first class content that is, it, that is sort of primarily hosted on qlang.org or indeed sort of reposts, for want of a better phrase, of content that is hosted elsewhere. We just want to make it easier for people to actually um, volunteer that content, maintain that content. Uh, and so we're uh, that's part of the effort that's going into alpha.qlang.org at the moment. And critically as well, um, as we've been uh, learning about how people learn about Q, um, it's very, one of the challenges that people repeat quite often is that, there's so many different use cases for Q, and that in and of itself is somewhat daunting because you don't necessarily know where to start. And so when we're coming up with this better documentation story for, for Q, uh, and specifically how we solve that on qlang.org, we're thinking hard about how we can address that, that sort of large landscape of documentation. So search navigation is a key part of that, and the key to good search and navigation is good structure to the data good pagging, so that people, when they identify who they are effectively are, are on arriving at qlang.org, can then easily navigate to the documentation which is most likely to be um, appropriate and interesting to them. So these are the, um, the, they're the main goals that we have. As I said, we should be at a, in a position where we'll be tweeting out an announcement and also doing it via the Q announcements discussion we have um, in GitHub discussions. Uh, an announcement that alpha.qlang.org is released, in quotes. It, given that it's a, an alpha, it will be alpha quality. Um, but we'd be delighted for feedback on whether it be the content, the structure, the organization of the site, um, the design of the site, whatever it might be. This is, the, this is the sort of the firing of the starting pistol where we actually want to get others involved. Um, we, there, we have a straw man that will be alpha.qlang.org, and it's ours to then sort of take forward uh, and make it the the, the best documentation uh, available that we can for Q. Uh, and that's going to be very much be a community effort. So look forward to um, engaging with folks on that. Um, 
So I will now hand over to Carmen on everything ecosystem. Hi, all. Uh, yes, so um, as we see more and more people picking up Q and using Q in their tool chains and their um, their product stacks, every uh, their libraries, um, things for things small and large, we are starting to really think uh, hard about how we want to support that growing and thriving community and ecosystem. Uh, but also how we can support Q core engineering to be able to think about the highest impact changes, features, tools, um, updates to be able to keep up with the ecosystem demand. And then in addition to support, support the Q core engineering team, think about how we can support everyone out in the ecosystem, um, whether that's people we could partner with or people who want to partner with the Q open source project or integrate um, their own workflows or have a, whatever that partnership might look like, whatever that support is needed. Uh, just trying to recognize what are the levers for a thriving ecosystem and, and, and work those. Uh, and in addition to that, making sure we align the entire ecosystem of the Q content. So alpha.qlang.org will be the, the keystone, but there's a lot of other content that people are writing out there to help with the learning. Um, and we, we would love to continue to work and align and, and, and uh, highlight and uh, have you contribute to that content ecosystem. And um, tools and solutions are no different. So if you have Q content, a Q tool or Q based uh, product that you'd like to share, let us know. And typically we have a public share in our main Q repo on GitHub discussions and we tag it or categorize it as show and tell. Uh, but if you aren't ready quite to share it publicly, um, email us or contact us in the Slack community Slack and um, we, we'd be willing to hear and, and see what you're all building and hacking on. And I will hand this over to the next slide. Oh, I've just lost the presenter view. Where is it? There it is. Dominic, thank you. Uh, you're on mute, Dominic. So uh, from the project upside, um, we have a lot with planning the KubeCon Amsterdam. Uh, a lot of us will be there. Um, if you, you want to meet, if you want to talk, just reach out to us through the usual channel, whatever works best for you, we'll, I will certainly be there. And then as well as in the last uh, calls, um, I'm, my task, the main task has not changed. There's a lot of operational support for the Q project. You see what was achieved in the last few months. There's a lot of work with seven people uh, all over the globe. So uh, we had to really revamp and rethink how we organize, how what tools are we using, what processes, so that all the information is where it needs to be. Uh, this also includes like uh, feedback, user feedback, and also use cases. And this is also a continuous effort. So we have anything, I, I just uh, repeat uh, comments, uh, what, what Carmen just said, please share with us. We're always interested what people are doing with Q, uh, what, what we could do with Q. So let us know and as also paul said uh, we're working on alpha and i'll also support it there on the operation side and i think that was it from my side great I thank you thanks everyone um moving swiftly on to announcements this is sort of being covered already but we will be at kubecon uh, eu next week um so just to repeat please reach out to us if this it, when we were at kubecon in north america in autumn time last year um, it was fantastic. There were a, a couple of uh, Q talks, which were great to go along to, and we'll share details of talks uh, that might be of interest to folks um, that we spot. Um, but one of the biggest things, and I see um, Sam Boyer on the call as well, was just the, the random bumping into folks that we had in um, the corridors, the corridor track, as it were, where we ended up just sort of sitting down with folks, hacking on Q, kicking ideas around, um, We'd, we'd be delighted to, to do more, much more of that uh, at KubeCon EU as well. Um, whether it be problems that you're having with Q, or ideas that you have for Q, or challenges you want to put to the Q project of, here's a problem that we face at work, 
it sort of feels like you could solve this, but not quite clear actually what a path to adopting Q even in a sort of a small way would look like. Uh, we'd be delighted to sort of sit down and spend time talking through those sorts of things. So please do reach out to us, whatever it might be you'd like to chat about. Um, community updates, as I said, um, and Carmen has mentioned as well, we, we previously had in uh, uh, previous community calls a section where we did sort of flick through a whole sort of deck of um, updates from the community. In the interest of time, we're not doing that today. Um, just simply because it ran on and became a bit uh, bit too cumbersome to try and uh, include in the same call. Um, and similarly, the Spotlight session, we mentioned this um, in Slack and previous updates as well. The Spotlight session we used to have in previous community calls as well, we've also moved out. And Cube Vela will be the next Spotlight for Q. And they've been a long time user of Q, actually. And we were, as part of the 0 0.5 release, um, delighted to actually get them off the 0.2.2 where they'd been stuck for some time. Um, so yeah, we'll be focusing on the spotlight on um, Qvela next time we have such a session, but it will be separate from the community call in order that we can really do justice to them talking about their use case in more detail than we could cover in like five or 10 minutes. Um, comments previously sort of mentioned if there is something you're working on that you'd like to share with us please do so via any of these channels here um just mentioned that the next community call date tbc we're sort of slightly lagging given that we missed the the february date that we would otherwise have had in our usual monthly schedule and we're slightly late on the march one um, we'll just see where things stand when we come back from KubeCon EU and then pencil in a date uh, at that point there. Just whatever feels sensible because trying to pencil something in right now is a bit premature given that there's quite a lot that's going to happen over the next couple of weeks, um, including KubeCon EU. Um, just our regular call for feedback. Um, if there's anything you'd like to see more of, less of, um, Particularly, we've, we, as we said, we'll be sending out this uh, discussion later on today that talks about uh, the release plan, future release plan, and basically um, not really a diagnosis of what happened with the, the 0 0.5 re release, but sort of a reflection on it and how actually we can improve our release cadence um, and just keep the community better updated on what it is we're working on in terms of features, but also what releases are coming up and when you can expect things to land. So that's feedback that we've um, received before. And so hopefully we're now sort of putting that into action. And with the release update that Marcel gave at the beginning of this call, you now have a bit of a better feel for um, what's coming up. Uh, as I said, that discussion will make that a bit more concrete in terms of putting it down in some words. Um, uh, but if there's still gaps that you, you, you find a, um, exist after reading that um, discussion, please let us know, and we'll be happy to um, start filling in some of those gaps for you. Um, so with that, uh, we can turn it over at this point. Um, there's been a number of things that we've talked about today which folks might want to talk about. The 0 0.5 release, the 0 0.6 Alpha 1 release um, with the required fields implementation, the modules proposal that has been released, WebAssembly, alpha.qlang.org, Unity. So we really open the floor at this point and we've left ourselves plenty of time in case there are things that people would like to discuss. Um, uh, any of those areas or indeed anything else? Steve. Hi, I am leave. Got to uh, skim the modules proposal so far. What I didn't catch, sorry if I missed it, is there any uh, proposal for how the registry will store these? Will it be compatible with, say, OCI artifacts? Something that we could expect some existing registry infrastructure to support? Um, so it's unfortunate that Roger is not here because he will he would be the. Uh, but but still, uh, so, so far we follow the same structure as as the Go proxy uses. Even though it's the registry, it has the same underlying structure. Um, so there would be an an API for it basically. But um, if if you have suggestions, uh, I mean, we can change the API because for now it's still close, right? Like only talking to the tooling. So so if you. 
I think there's a huge benefit from supporting a, a certain format. Uh, let us know. Daniel? To add a bit of context, because I've been, Unity and modules are quite close, and they even share a bit of internal details. So, so Roger and I have been working closely. Um, we've been, the design for modules, or rather the registry has borrowed from Go as far as it's been useful. So for example, for the actual uh, storing the versions, the source code for modules, it is a zip just like in Go because a zip allows for random access. And the hashing is not over the whole zip. It's over the files inside the zip in a way that's agnostic to the order of the files. So all of that, for example, is copied um, from Go. Uh, some other things are, are not exactly the same because again, you know, Go and Q are not the same. Uh, but we have been borrowing from Go, uh, from the proven methods of Go, as far as we've been able to. Sam? Hi. Um, I had a question about the required fields proposal. There's a section here sure. where, uh, where you talk about the extraction of defaults pattern. And this was discussed oh. a little bit in the issue. I'm just curious if there is anything more written about what this expected pattern is, and then maybe also specifically like the, the proposal hand waves over what looks like a built-in function default. Um, and I'm wondering if any new like built-ins have come along with required fields. Um, so I don't know what the built-in function uh, default refers to, but, but uh, oh yeah, that, okay, that, that thing. Yeah, so I, I don't think we're, we're going there uh, actually, okay. at least not anytime soon. Um, but, um, oops. Uh, yeah, but insofar the, um, um, required fields. So, so generally, we believe. So, if, if if you start adding default values to your schema, and people want to combine schema with other things, default values might get in the way. Especially if you have two schemas or two parts that both have the same uh, default values, or you want to be able to specify your own default values. Uh, having default values are, is fairly limited. So, as as part of the, there's no restriction to this at all within the language. Like you can do whatever you want. Still, I mean, it's backwards. It's a backwards compatible change. Um, but basically, as a matter of style, what we suggest is that you use um, uh, like the hash, basically. If you have a package that provides schemas, that the schemas with hashes are basically without defaults, and then you can have like a version without the hash where you have like the, the common defaults or, and, and like factor out, uh, you know, more specific defaults in other packages. So that's all sort of different mix-ins, if you will. Right, so so that pattern um, seems to give the most flexibility, um, and the way how required fields come in there. So one of the because we we now have three types of fields essentially, right? Like the regular fields, then you have the what we now call field constraints, right? Like optional and required. Um, so this might be a bit confusing to people, but we looked at many of the use cases of how people use fields in practice for whether it's for templating or for, for form schema, like policy, whatever. And it really boils down to having five different fields, two of which are conditional. So you can really represent it with three different field types. So to reduce that uh, confusion, basically what we're saying, okay, let's reserve field constraints for schema definition. So if you want to have pure schema, it's only field constraints. So every field has to be required or optional. And if you're if you're doing templating or data, whatever, you only have regular fields, right? And you basically separate it this way. You don't have to, right? Like it's still Q. You can combine it in any way you want. But as a matter of idiom, um, this seems to be like a fairly easy rule that basically leads to people doing the right thing, um, uh, you know, by default. So, for example, if you just have this one rule saying. Okay, you know, top level schema should be only required or uh, optional constraints or, or field constraints, basically. Um, you would naturally not put uh, defaults in the schema because it's, it's, it doesn't make sense at this point, right? So, um, so this would be, yeah, this would be a fairly um, easy way to, to enforce that, that sort of standard. So, the only tricky thing, so where I say it, you can do whatever you want, it's not entirely true when it comes to modules. Because when it comes to modules, we probably want to enforce backwards compatibility uh, constraints, right? So that if you say, if you don't increase a major version, uh, I'm not a huge fan of semantic versioning, but, but <laughs> you know, since we have to pick something. Um, so if you if you do and, and we need to have uh, with modules there, there are some benefits to, to giving some guarantees right or having having some uh, 
guarantee should be able to give to users. So we can basically say, okay, if you increase a major version, um, then you can break backwards compatibility, but otherwise not, right? But then what does that mean, right? Like what is backwards compatibility? Um, and this is now tied into two definitions, right? And that would still work with default values, but you have to be really careful with default values and backwards compatibility. So, um, but yeah, so all of this will, in the end, encourage users to, to uh, use the idiomatic uh, sure. structuring, right? Like even, even though it's not required. Sure. So be, being that I've been working on a schema system, um, I have uh, run into every one of those things that you just listed. Um, yep. And uh, uh, we have not to date pulled defaults out, but we have an easy structure that that can be tucked into. So that's uh, it's easy enough to do. Um, I'm just to, just to emphasize, Sam, it's, yeah. as Marcel said, it's not required to extract right. them. It's just that that pattern is presenting itself as like the, the most idiomatic, the most natural from a, an author and consumer perspective. Oh, and, and I agree. In, in yep. general, I agree. The only thing that I care about with respect to having the defaults on the original schema declaration is that I do think, I noted this in the original discussion, I do think there is a value in there being um, one set of defaults above the rest that clearly come from the original author of the schema yep. and some yep. sort of primacy there is important to express, but that does not mean they have to be literally expressed like in line. Um, you just need yep. a different structure for it. I was going to say, uh, oh, I think I lost it. Oh, well, the um, the I've noticed in particular d defaults are very interesting in writing my own backwards compatibility checkers because Subsume really doesn't like to catch when you change a default. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm very interested in in picking up the changes that you've made with required fields and incorporating them into what we have, um, and to make it easier. Uh, just to, to, yeah, just on that note, actually, it, it's um, it, version zero point six is in alpha, mm -hmm. um, but we'd strongly encourage folks to um, pick up version zero point six alpha one, kick the tires on it. Um, the the, the playground at tip.qlang.org slash play is already required fields uh, enabled, as it were, because it's tracking the tip uh, of Q. So you can, e even if you just wanted to play around with it in the playground, it's absolutely possible to do that. And we'll um, perhaps just tweet a link to that to remind folks that that's possible. So you don't even need to upgrade any systems, et cetera. You can just have a very quick play around in the playground. Uh, and please do provide feedback, feedback, especially bugs or problems that you, you, anybody runs into. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned, uh, Sam, so with this um, recommended style, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or you say you have the schema with the, you know, prefix with the hash and then with the same name without the hash being sort of the, you know, the, the, schema with the defaults, like the standard defaults, right? Like th there mm -hmm. you have sort of the most authoritative version yeah. with defaults yeah. you could you could do. Yeah. yeah, that that conversation has gone. It is one of the rabbit holiest things that I've <laughs> discovered in working with a lot of people around. Um, you, you get into very subtle conversations about uh, uh, like if if as, as we do, we have front-enders who are working with TypeScript types that have been generated from Q types, and we use the default values in order to create initializers on the TypeScript end. But now you have folks who are used to developing a front-end application thinking about uh, like the life cycle of a TypeScript object in a very different way um, because we're asking them to think in a way that is ultimately centered on schema-specified defaults as opposed to yeah. what might be convenient to work inside of React. So yeah, it's, it's very... It's very rabbit holy. Yeah, and if you look at defaults uh, in general, right, like Q being uh, Q, so defaults are quite, the main reason why they were added is because it's quite important for templating. Very. Right, but yeah. defaults and schema is generally not a good thing to do. So this is why uh, protobufs uh, ditched them altogether, right? And I think it was Rob Pike was one of the people that really pushed hard for this within Google to get rid of defaults in, in protobufs, right? So Proto3. So this is... Uh, yeah, in, in schema, it's it's a bit 
tricky. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that seems like a discussion for another time. Yeah, the, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, Kevin? Well, we, we talked oh, about um, oh, potentially doing an, offi uh, an office hours for required field stuff. Please just, just ping um, and yeah. it, it, we can then sort of collect the date and just uh, folks can just join in ad hoc and we can hash through these things, hacking out a bit of code, whatever works. Cool. We're going to have a sort of Kevin. story around this soon that I think will be, sorry, sorry. We'll, we'll have a thing. No, no, no. We can talk later. I sorry. didn't mean to cut, a, cut across <laughs> you, Sam. It's Thank fine. you. Please. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we can, Kevin. Cool. Um, so I know that versions are hard and roadmaps are hard, but is that version slide that you showed earlier going to be posted? somewhere so there are a few features that i've been personally waiting on and it's fine i can be patient yeah. but it's nice to know approximately you know when those might be arriving yeah. um so there is smile in the github um repo there's milestones and these versions correspond directly to milestones so they're like ordered uh you know up to 0 0.8 right now in in, in github already okay. um so far, we only have added issues that have to be there. Oh. oh, dear. We just lost Kevin. He wasn't happy with that answer, Marcel, obviously. I, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think he's actually been dropping on and off a couple of times. He's back again. Is hey, he Kevin, back? you back? Oh. I'm back. I think it might be my work VPN that keeps dropping ah. the question, so I apologize. Yeah. No yes. So basically, um, you can take a look at what issues are there, but not all okay. issues are are ordered there. Um, so okay. if there are specific issues that you think, like, okay, we, I really think they should be in this version, then uh, then then please let us let us know. Uh, the big thing while we're here is that the, I tend to do a lot of scripting with Q, like basic things for user kind of setup. So I need to read their environment and you know this is often on mac machines and i'm trying to like read a you know a, a .ini file and trying to you know convert that or point out errors kind of like a discovery discoverability system um and to do code generation and stuff but the scripting is is kind of very much a second class right now but something like having just basic embeds into strings but within the lattice um, yeah. so that that way you can you know see the values and it makes debugging much easier um, and also just for the os environment variables just from a read-only capacity um, just to be able to know their you know username or whatever but immutable values that are read-only um, would be immensely helpful yeah, the environment would be, um, are, are these issues in GitHub? I believe so, yes. OK. Yeah, the environment variables is a, is a bit mm -hmm. tricky because it breaks uh, hermeticity, but it could be part of the injection, right, which is now individual values, but it could be potentially. But yeah, we have to look into that one. But the, um, um, the other one was, uh, sorry, what was the other one again? So let's say I just have a, a text file, and I want ah, the to embedding, yeah, yeah. embed. So yeah, embedding is a bit easier to do, um, especially when you think of YAML, though it's it's really complicated, right? Because there's not really one YAML version. So you have to be able, in your modules or something, you have to be able to specify, how do I have to interpret this YAML, right? Um, within in this my case, module. I just want it as a plain raw string that's not evaluated in any way. Yeah, because, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so we do want to have some embedding um, features, which will then also tie in with, with export, so that you basically can say, uh, with exporting, I want to chop my queue up like this and generate these, these files uh, directly instead of uh, having one big file, which is for Kubernetes, for example, extremely useful. But it depends a little bit um, on, on the needs of users, like whether we, how much we, prioritize that, right? So so it's, it's good if you can yeah, chime in. I've just, I've just linked the issue, Kevin, you've already commented on it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's issue 2031, uh, where, where we're talking about the native embed and export. And uh, Marcel, that issue is really sort of a capture of conversations you and I had a long time ago where we yeah. sort of brainstormed what this might look like. Um, Kevin, it's a very good point as to how and when this prioritization happens. 
um, uh, Jonathan Matthews and and many others have said, you know, this is an important thing here. Um, it, the thing is, I'm looking at this issue right now, and we don't have a milestone against no. it. And so I think what we need to do is um, th is a couple of things, really. Is I, I mentioned, Kevin, you might have dropped off just at the time I was talking about it, that we're going to be send starting a discussion about future releases and the, the plan around those. Um, I think as well, we need to work out, uh, sort of have like a, a shakedown, for want of a better phrase, of, okay, which issues are there? Have they got the correct milestones, yes or no? And whether something has got the correct milestone or not, we're not actually necessarily going to know ourselves on the Q team. And actually, we're sort of reliant on folks like yourself, Kevin, just shouting and saying, hey, hey, this has not got a milestone. We need it, blah, 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 right? And so... Um, What's tricky in so it's, it's the delight of an open source project, but it's also tricky at the same time is that there's lots of competing priorities. But I think what we could probably do with it is hearing a bit more loudly, this is a priority for us. And if if we then work out, our, well, actually, we need to sort of manage these priorities a bit better and help coordinate things, we'll take on that responsibility, right? So the, the more we shout, and if you say, look, we don't have a milestone for this, it needs a milestone, that actually is like a forcing function for it entering a milestone and therefore a release. Um, so uh, thank you for raising it. Um, uh, apologies, we don't have a milestone for it, but I think let's th that's the conversation we have to have, right, as to how we force it into a particular milestone. Um, so that it, so that you can then, as you said, actually do some sort of planning for want of a better phrase off the back of when it's going to be available or, or not, as the case may be. Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, hi. Uh, I was really hoping you could expand uh, on, I think you were talking about with the required fields, there were kind of five states of, of fields and two of them were kind of subclasses of the other three. So there, there were three types of fields. There were the required fields, the optional fields. And I don't really understand what the third type would be or what's the difference between uh, the fields that, uh, that are, exist today and, and the required fields. And just if you could talk about that a bit more, it would help me help my mental model a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to be honest, uh, I, I don't know if I, uh, Paul, do you have the required field proposal handy? Mike? Yeah, I've just linked. I've just linked to exactly the point that Mike I, is referring to. I thought you would, yeah. You I'll, could, I'll Marcel, you could do a brief, you could do a brief version. Uh, and Mike, what I'd suggest is what we could do is, as I said, um, offered that there's an office hour session we could do where you, we could go into these sorts of details. Uh, I'm just half keeping an eye on the time. Um, yeah. and we probably yeah. want to give ourselves about five minutes. So Mike, let's let's go for a brief answer if it's okay. Yeah. And then let's use like an office hour session to dive into it in more detail if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. so, so, sure. so these, uh, just very briefly, if you open that link, you can see the five listed. So one of them is the regular field. A field is defined, field is defined with a given value. That's what you usually would expect. Then a field may be defined with a given value. So this is like the optional field. And then you can say a field must be defined. Right, so I know what the value is, but I want the user to specify this, and um, these are all different. And it's it's if 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 you're a user of Q for only one of its users, you might think, well, I only need two of those, right? Like for schema, you would only need two of those typically, but if since Q is used for schemas and templating and policy, right? Like you you cannot get away with um, um, not distinguishing between these subtle variants. And where required fields, a very obvious case where, where required fields solve something that you cannot do otherwise, is if you say uh, this field must be defined and it must be the value two, for example. In Kubernetes, you see this a lot with the kind, right? Like the kind must be of a certain string. Um, and you, if you want to, as a matter of policy, you want to require the user to explicitly specify the kind, um, then right now you cannot express that in, in Q, for example, with the field types we have. That's in a nutshell, but you can see there, there's more examples and more explanation in the link that Paul provided. And we'd certainly be happy Thanks. to go Thanks into detail with, with examples and the like, Mike, on uh, in the the office hour session. So please feel free to chime in on on uh, on that and say yeah. would love a just so that we know who's interested in that session. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in order so to avoid the confusion to the user to not have three, we basically say you have constraints 
and you have fields. You have one type of fields and then you have two type of constraints. So it's already not three, but sort of like two different types, which where you know one type has two variants basically. So that makes it hopefully a little bit um, easier. And basically these constraints would typically be used in schema, whereas the rest would use the other field. So that, that makes it conceptually a bit easier. Made a lot easier to write the documentation also, to be honest. Uh, Jonathan. Okay. Hello. Um, the modules proposal, I have not yet read. Uh, I'm just wondering, is that module, is that discussion the right place to put discussions around the under pinning of the system being registry based or mm -hmm. is that a is that a done deal such that that would only be noise within the context of that discussion which we better place for nuances around it um yeah i mean the, the choice to do a registry that's um unless people come with a really good argument to not do that i don't i don't see that happening that we move away from it right like even um, even if you see like, um, you know, we're talking some folks from the Go team, it's like with the advantage of a proxy, even they said like, just, just do a registry, right? Like uh, basically there's almost even, yeah, sort of supposed proposals, pro uh, proponent of, uh, of uh, proxies, right? It's basically say user, user registry. Um, and that's basically for our particular use case, uh, but also the complexities for, for the user may be interesting, right? If you just have GitHub, you just upload it, but the, the uh, amount of complexity you get from a, from a proxy and this VCS proxy based approach, it's, it's really quite, uh, quite large. Uh, maybe Daniel can, can fill some, some in here as well. I, I'm very much asking uh, over the eye on the time, where would you like that discussion to take to, to take place? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, th that's the right place. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would definitely say uh, I'll let Daniel chime in in a second. I definitely say it's the right place. Um, you know, just it's every conversation that I've been part of in the Q community has been um, a constructive one where people may have different opinions on why something is important or not right, but it has been constructive. I think that's the the spirit in which. Um, all conversations have been had. And so I, I don't see modules being any different in that respect. I think one of the interesting things as far as modules concerned, as far as uh, the registry is concerned is, and we tried to place an emphasis on this in the proposal, is the, the use case of private modules, especially in an environment like a, uh, in a non-open source environment. And by that sort of, you have to read like company slash corporate environment, whatever it might be, right? Um, and in that situation, the the, the win or, or the, the clearer case for, for registry is quite real uh, versus the proxy, at least. Um, but yeah, Jonathan, just to emphasize, please do comment in the, in the discussion. It's, it absolutely makes sense to center all the discussion in one place. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just take one more question um, and then we will wrap up because we're close to the hour and we can beat the hour. That would be great. Zach, please. Hey everybody, hopefully this is a quick one. I just have a question um, regarding, uh, well, just asking what are some areas right now that are in need of more contributors and more work? That is an excellent question. Um, I would, um, I can answer on my own behalf um, and I'll, Daniel's put his hand up to answer as well, which is great. Um, Qlang.org is absolutely an area where we will be looking for people to contribute, whether it be on the content side or to sort of the other end of the spectrum, dare I say, the, the more infrastructural side of things. Um, once alpha.qlang.org has is landed and we've made a good start on beta, I'll be flipping, as I said in my update, to LSP side of things. LSP, once we have a skeleton in place, is another area where there's like clear areas for contributions. Um, another off the top of my head is the area of what we call adapters or encoders. Uh, for example, Q's interaction with uh, JSON or YAML, they are referred to as encoders or adapters and protocol buffers, Go and other uh, adapters also exist as well. That story is very much incomplete though. For example, one very commonly asked uh, for adapter is TOML. And, and so it, those sorts of adapters are also very discrete areas where especially if someone has um, good experience in such an area and would like to sort of explore that space. Um, that is also an area where we'd love to hear from folks. 
Um, so that's just gives you a few areas that one thing we do need to do and um, double down on that as part of this sort of future releases plan is when we do that issue gardening, a number of folks have said, please, can you better document these things and highlight them with labels in GitHub? Uh, and so that is something that we will do as well. But please feel free to reach out if there's a particular area of interest that you have that you'd like to discuss. We'd, we'd be super happy to talk. Daniel? Um, I'll mention a couple of ideas that I think were really helpful for me with Go, and I think they would work really well with Q as well. One of them is running master. And if you run tip or master the version of Q, you're more likely to find things that are slightly broken, or you're more likely to you know, um, be involved in the latest development. And the other side of it is being active in the issue tracker or the Q&A sections of either GitHub or Slack. Um, because on one hand, it helps the project because you know more questions are being answered more quickly. Sometimes we don't even have time to answer all the questions that come in. And on the other hand, um, I would say a, a good portion of those questions end up being bugs either that have been already filed or that haven't been filed yet. So that is always valuable for the project. But we're very much open to ideas as well, Zach, just to, it's not a closed, closed answer by any stretch. Okay, we are on the hour, um, maybe slightly under because we started four minutes after the half. Um, but thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's been a great call. Uh, just a reminder, we'd love to do an office hour session for required fields. We'd love to do an office hour session for modules, if that's something that people wanted to talk about. Um, kind of to Kevin's point on when are we going to milestone these things, and Kevin is unfortunately dropped off again. Um, <laughs> uh, but when we milestone these things that are coming um, in future, please, please shout, um, whether it be in issues, in Slack, until sort of you feel like you've got a satisfactory answer on okay this feature is going to be in this release or we have a, a date for office hours um so on the office hours for um modules and oh the other one's just gone required fields goodness me um i will send out a tweet and i'll also do, do something in slack and look to coordinate around those two points there and also the github discussions as well in order you can coordinate the time uh, that, that works best for folks. Um, it might be we need a couple of sessions. Happy, happy to do that as well. But if you're at KubeCon EU, you can short circuit all of this and just do it live with us in person. So for those of you who are going to be there, look forward to it. Please be in touch. And for everybody else, we'll announce again. We'll aim for like our monthly cycle of um, community calls. Um, modulo us being away for KubeCon, so there might be a bit of slippage in order to sort of take that into account. So until next time, thank you very much. Thank you.